Dear friends, thank you for joining us for our six week session on the tablets. Um, this evening is the last, it's the part two of the long healing prayer. Um, we do have Catherine Caney, who's going to be saying a short prayer for protection for, of the Bob. And we hope you all um, send up that energy to the Bob. Thank you. Ordain for me, O oh my Lord, and for those who believe in thee, that which is deemed best for us in thine estimation, as set forth in the mother book. For within the grasp of thy hand, thou holdest the determined measures of all things. Thy goodly gifts are unceasingly showered upon such as cherish thy love. And the wondrous tokens of thy heavenly bounties are amply bestowed on those who recognize thy divine unity. We commit unto thy care whatsoever thou hast destined for us and implore thee to grant us all the good that thy knowledge embraceth. Protect me, O my Lord, from every evil that thine omniscience perceiveth, inasmuch as there is no power nor strength but in thee. No triumph is forthcoming save from thy presence, and it is thine alone to command. Whatever God hath willed hath been, and that which he hath not willed shall not be. There is no power nor strength except in God, the most exalted, the most mighty. So friends, um, we do have John here and we have Mr. John Colsto actually here out of the hospital. So John, please. Okay. Just a brief note. I tested negative for the virus, although for about six weeks afterwards, uh, I was testing positive. I was discharged from the hospital last Saturday. So this is being delivered from the comfort of my easy chair in my living room rather than on a hospital bed. And I'm feeling fine and slowly getting stronger. Many, many thanks to those of you who so thoughtfully remember me and your prayers and thoughts and tablets. Uh, any, uh, any other comments? Otherwise, we will just continue. It is appropriate here to repeat from last week the story of an early use of the prayer at the direction of Baha'u'llah in the prison of Akka. Many thanks to uh, Mrs. Tina Selvich-Sabet for providing it. Um, Netta, would you read it, please? Absolutely. Um, one of those who fell ill and reportedly died was Mirza Jafari Yazdi, whom Abdul Baha described as patient and long-suffering, a faithful attendant at the holy threshold. He was a servant to all the friends, working day and night, a quiet man, sparing of speech in all things, relying entirely upon God. Abdul Baha related the following incident involving Mirza Jafari Yazdi, in which the long healing prayer was chanted for him. At the time when we were in the barracks, he fell dangerously ill and was confined to his bed. He suffered many complications until finally the doctor gave him up and would visit him no more. Then the sick man breathed his last. Mirza Agajan ran to Baha'u'llah with word of the death. Not only had the patient ceased to breathe, but his body was already going limp. His family were gathered about him mourning him, shedding bitter tears. The blessed beauty said, go, chant the prayer of Ya Shafi, O thou the healer, and Mirza Jafar will come alive. Very rapidly, he will be as well as ever. I reached his bedside. His body was cold and all the signs of death were present. Slowly, he began to stir. Soon he could move his limbs, and before an hour had passed, he lifted his head, sat up, and proceeded to laugh and tell jokes. 
He lived for a long time after that, occupied as ever with serving the friends. This giving service was a point of pride with him. To all, he was a servant. He was always modest and humble, calling God to mind and to the highest degree, full of hope and faith. Well, I'm not expecting any of you to be retrieved from, retrieved from the, the dead necessarily. Uh, you do know the power of the prayer. And the, in the actually, the um, aspect of healing is the most prominent thing for most Western believers. Heal or healing is mentioned 45 times in the prayer. Healing is also one of the three specific requests in the next to the last paragraph that appear to be the object of all the supplications. The nature of that appeal includes much more than just physical healing. Before we get into these, there are some more of his awesome gifts. Three redemptive, three redemptive attributes conferred upon mankind are mentioned. They are generosity, mercy, and grace. Netta? Generosity. Two specific acts of generosity are stated. The first is the portals of thy bounty and grace that are opened wide. Access it not, only available it is opened wide, and the whole world is invited. The second element of generosity is that the temple of thy holiness was established upon the throne of eternity. Baha'u'llah's revelation is not only available to everyone. This temple of holiness is the fulfillment of ages past as found in all religions. Various terms have been used. Holy City, the New Jerusalem, Paradise, Nirvana, Elysium, heaven on earth, the temple of unity, fifth world, and so on. These pronouncements stand in contrast to the biblical warning, straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Here all mankind is invited to participate. Matthew 7, 14. In many religious communities today, there are many sincere souls who caught an early glimpse of this age of fulfillment, but have an incomplete perception. They may loudly proclaim insights and signs of the end of the world is at hand, and a new way of life is about to emerge. They see many signs, but fall short of recognizing God's most recent revelation. Unfortunately, many of these proponents are so attached to their own understandings, that their ears are deaf and eyes are blind to the fulfillment of what they envision or are trying to accomplish. Oddly, those who have studied their scriptures the most seem to have the hardest resistance to any and all different understandings. There are also many clear-minded individuals and organizations working for a social betterment of the world as envisioned by Baha'u'llah even though they do not necessarily realize that. Chief among them are people working to establish the two overarching themes of this revelation, the oneness of mankind and establishing world peace. They are building bridges to the new world. There are countless others working toward the fulfillment of other teachings brought by Baha'u'llah, such as curbing injustice, economic inequities, environmental issues, the harmony of science and religion, universal education, and so forth. These are all works in progress. Building bridges to the new world. Presently, these projects are incomplete, going only partway across the swirling river of global chaos. Many are slightly off the divine mark as they attempt to apply material or economic solutions to what are really spiritual problems. I want to repeat that trying to apply material or economic solutions to what are really spiritual problems. Anetta? Only the Baha'i revelation includes the spiritual solution for economic, material, and or social problems, and the design of the needed bridge to span the entire river of frustration and tribulation, complete with the infrastructure needed to address future concerns. The distinction is all-embracing, 
but won't be discussed here. There is a chapter in John's book, The Covenant on You and You, which addresses the issue. These partially built bridges are found in the portals of thy most bounty and grace that are opened wide. Again, there is an invitation for all humanity. This prayer helps anyone better understand the parallel processes inside and outside the faith. From the inside, building the foundation of the new world order and the part all of us are playing, and outside the faith, many people fostering the elements of the emerging civilization by those who have not yet recognized the source of their inspiration. Ultimately, the two will be connected. And the progress being made outside the faith, done by others, all, who albeit are unwittingly working on God's greater plan, will merge with the divine plan. Mercy, the great mercy given in this special invitation to partake of thy bounties and bestowals, it is important to note that those who have recognized Baha'u'llah are obligated to inform others of the faith or the uh, um, teachings of the faith. This is an invitation, not a demand, specifically as stated in the Tabernacle of Unity. Meta? Therefore, it behooveth him who is the recipient of an inward or outward gift who partaketh of the bread of heaven to inform and invite his friends with the utmost love and kindness. If they respond favorably, his object is attained. Otherwise, he should leave them to themselves without contending with them or uttering a word that would cause the least sadness. For the first time in religious history, the mercy of God calls upon believers of the new revelation to spread the divine message with the provision that everyone has the right to ignore the invitation without argument, disapproval, or condemnation. While ignoring the call of God, his, while ignoring the call of God has dire consequences, both for the individual and society, there is no room for coercion. The fact that all created things are invited to the table of bounties and bestowals carries a strong implication that man has a custodial responsibility, not just for fellow humans, but an obligation to nurture and preserve nature, not to exploit it for perceived short-term benefits. Custodial responsibility extends to all two-legged, four-legged, six-legged, and crawly things, as well as plants and animals, and inanimate things. Of course, the needs of fellow passengers on spaceship Earth top the list. The grace of Baha'u'llah leads with the word yay, or yes, on behalf of all of heaven and earth, as if to express delight that the divine process has begun and is working. The healing has started. God and even the denizens on high display enthusiastic pleasure that the process has been launched. Specifically, happiness is expressed that, quote, thy sovereignty and thy grandeur stood revealed at the dawn time when the might of thy dominion was made manifest. Dawn is mentioned twice in this tablet. The Lord of the dawn is mentioned and also reference here to the dawn time. Nada? They celebrate the dawn time as if it were announcing the successful conclusion of the entire production. There is unrivaled celestial delight that the progression is underway, an exclamation of joy that the regeneration of mankind has started. A Westerner might shout hooray or yay ho while clapping hands or jerking back a raised arm with a clenched fist and enthusiasm for the stellar launching of the stage of the human drama. They are celebrating where mankind is headed over the next 500,000 years. Seeing the joy of the end in the beginning is reminiscent of Baha'u'llah's comment in the Valley of Knowledge, that those who journey in the garden land of knowledge, because they see the end in the beginning, see peace in war and friendliness in anger. Thus, the excitement and exclamation of the beginning of the divine processes 
accentuated the conviction of its successful conclusion, generating the strength to carry on when the going gets tough, as it inevitably must, at least periodically. This serves as a caution for those of us who strive to serve the Havilah in these days. We are not far from the dawn. For us, it's early morning. The Guardian referred to us as the generation of the half-light living at a time which may be designated as the period of incubation of the world commonwealth. Envisioned by Baha'u'llah has been assigned a task whose high privilege we can never sufficiently appreciate and the arduous of, the arduousness of which we as yet but dimly recognize, close quote. And even though that was written uh, in the 1930s, it applies today. We aren't that, that much further from the dawn tide, and we're still struggling in the half, stumbling in the half light. We should not get discouraged because things are not going as we would like. The denizen on high celebrated the inevitable victory, despite unavoidable past, present, and future obstacles and reversals, all of which are both temporary and laden with surprising elements to spur on the process. For example, just look at how the current virus made prominent the reality of the oneness of mankind and that the earth is but one country. The unprecedented vaccine development demonstrates that unity in action produces real results. Disarray, as seen in too many countries, shows how the common malady of divisiveness leads to confusion and contributes to greater chaos and inappropriate or no action. Believers today need to remember this and celebrate the victory as already achieved, even in the midst, in the midst of dysfunction and despair. The denizens on high, who are just a little closer to the dawn than we are, celebrated the inevitable victory. Why can't we? The reminder to see the end of the beginning is followed by six more elements of a redemptive nature, concluding with nine aim, the most potent of all. Beauteous names, noble and sublime attributes, exalted remembrance, pure and spotless beauty, hidden light in the most hidden pavilion. I love that. This hidden light reaffirms the fact that much illumination remains beyond the kin of men and angels. Once again, there is a fact, human factor of being limited by time and space and our own knowledge, perception, and experience. And I don't know about the rest of you, but I've got a bag full of questions when I get over on the other side where I might be able to get some of that hidden light. The last of the six is the brief but strong reminder of the enormous price paid to bring this sublime message to humankind. His name, the greatest name, Baha'u'llah, endured innumerable persecutions for delivering this divine message, quote, cloaked with the garment of affliction every morn and eve. The prayer is filled with prescriptions for the ills of the world. Yea, is a dramatic and monumental exclamation of joy, expressing delight that the process has started and cannot fail. True, inaction and indiscretion on the part of the believers and delay ultimate victory, but it will not be stopped. Then we get to the specific request. Isn't that it? Then comes the point of the supplications, protection, healing, and guidance for those who seek it. Protection, rather than someone who merely has a copy or carries it around like a kind of talisman or lucky charm, to protect the bearer of this blessed tablet the protection can relate to the degree to which these creative words have been internalized as part and parcel of one who reciteth it. Memorization helps, and it does more than aid in internalizing the meanings of the words. It creates a deeper understanding and a desire to apply these divine truths in life. There's an Eastern story that I love that says that a man who knows all the books but has little understanding, is like a donkey with a library on his back. I just love that imagery. That doesn't mean that the person won't have problems, rather the plea for protection while dealing with the problems 
that are inescapable parts of life and necessary for spiritual growth. That same reasoning can apply to communities. Reaching the level of the individual or community become the bearer and may even be the house as specifically mentioned for this blessing for the blessings of this tablet. Rising to that level of reflecting these qualities is so special that anyone who deals with them or passes round, as it says in their tablet in, that is anyone who associates with the individual or community who has internalized the spirit of these holy words also receives a special protection. That is to say, when the message is incorporated into the fiber of the individual or community, blessings are conferred upon others, even though the bearer may be unaware that spiritual protection is being radiated as people will go about the normal business of daily life. I served in a community with a teenaged boy who seemed to attract problems. It's as if he, had a, he were a max, magnet for them. During a fast, or I'm sorry, during a feast, I happened to have him in my field of vision when I heard the verse, quote, we fain would hope that the people of Baha may be guided by the blessed words, say, all things are of God. I wondered how his problems were of God. That's when I realized how much his problems had contributed to the growth of the greater development and understanding of that spiritual assembly as we consulted on his problems and tried to help him on his way. On a practical level, I have heard non-Baha'is say that they just feel better than they name some Baha'i when that so-and-so is around. Or they step into a home for the first time and exclaim over the special feelings of peace, tranquility, and protection just by being in a facility that houses and cherishes this trusted talent. The, when it's interior, when the uh, spirit is internalized, it radiates out and even the walls can, uh, can reflect them. Oh, when, uh, oh, who was it? Hand of the Cause. Dorothy Baker was in India. She was going to some place and she stepped into the room and she said, Martha Root stayed here. I can feel it from the walls. And so those who are spiritually sensitive can uh, uh, discover things of that sort that some of us that are beyond the comprehension of some of us. In contrast, there was a couple in a large community that would sit on a park bench every day and pray they would meet a seeker. Each month, they would turn in one or two enrollment cards to the local spiritual assembly. Unfortunately, many of the new enrollees soon left the faith. A member of that spiritual assembly was concerned about it. He told me that he went to the couple and asked why. With tears in their eyes, they said, the newly enrolled believer did not experience the same degree of love among the members of the community that they did in our living room. The core activities are a potent and effective force to counteract that ever-present danger of losing touch with the spiritual reality and purpose of the faith. Now to go on to healing. The request is to heal thou, then by it every sick, diseased, and poor one applies to all humanity. What is the nature of that healing? Four aspects are mentioned. From every tribulation and distress, from every loathsome affliction and sorrow, that wide swath includes all mankind mired in an endless array of undesirable conditions. One indication of the scope of this healing was implied by a clarifying statement by Abdul Baha, all the sorrow and the grief that exist come from the world of matter. The spiritual world bestows only the joy. Repeating a reference from last week, it is useful to think of prayer as asking to work with God. Baha'u'llah said, if it be our pleasure, we shall render the cause victorious through the power of a single word from our presence. 
However, since our loving providence surpasseth all things, we have ordained that complete victory should be achieved through speech and utterance. Abdul Baha Paris Talks. That same principle can be applied broadly. It is within God's power to eliminate all maladies, physical and others. Why does he allow them to continue to plague his people? For at least the rest of this dispensation, humanity will be mired in the world of matter. There appears to be an endless ongoing process of confronting the multifaceted and ever appearing plights mankind must face as part of the continuous struggle for both, in the words of the Guardian, advancing, quote, a slowly maturing civilization, and for the individual advancing towards the spiritual world, which, rejoy, which bestow only joy. This process is not restricted to physical healing or fixing problems. The specific plea in the healing prayer is to be relieved of tribulations, distress, loathsome afflictions and sorrows. That is, all the collateral burdens that are secondary and residual consequences of being sick, diseased, or poor one, such as depression, feeling under par or inadequate, extra financial burdens, little energy or enthusiasm, inertia, and so forth. All of these cha challenges appear to be essential in the greater scheme of human development, both for the individual and collectively. Problems will continue for mankind to face with new ones coming for future generations. And I shudder to think of the kinds of problems they're going to be facing. Netta? Relief is found in contentment. The value of contentment cannot be overstated. Baha'u'llah said, be content in all conditions. By this, the person is preserved from bad condition and from lassitude. Shun grief and sorrow. They cause the greatest misery. Say, jealousy eats the body and anger burns the liver. Refrain from these two as you would avoid a lion. More than a condition, contentment is an option. You don't get rid of your problems to gain contentment. Contentment enables you to deal with your problems. I want to repeat that. You don't get rid of your problems to gain contentment. Rather, you have contentment, which enables you to deal with your problems. Contentment is a spiritual and physical and emotional remedy of special value in these stressful days in which we live. It has amazing beneficial and healing powers for a wide range of circumstances, known and unknown, seen and unseen, both immediate and long-term. The importance of contentment is seen in Baha'u'llah's words of wisdom. Early in the list of those 22 succinct poignant statements, contentment is mentioned twice. The very first one says, quote, the force of all good is trust in God, submission unto his command, and contentment with his holy will and pleasure. And the fourth one says, quote, the source of all glory is acceptance of whatsoever the Lord hath bestowed and contentment with that which God hath ordained. Contentment should not be confused with being passive or indifferent. Abdu baha was the embodiment of contentment, but he was hardly passive. His contentment came from being fully engaged in the work of the cause. And he is the exemplar of all mankind. We can choose to be content, no matter what the circumstances. Popular wisdom holds that good health and vitality are important objects in and of themselves. Just look at the, all the ads for healing agents, healing agents on television. However, the writings seem to indicate a higher use as a means of better knowing and worshiping God. The purpose of life is, as they said in the uh, uh, noonday prayer, to know and worship God. Even good health can lead to loathsome afflictions. Abdul Baha explained it this way. 
if the health and well-being of the body be expended in the path of the kingdom, this is very acceptable and praiseworthy. And if it is expended to the benefit of the human world in general, even though it be to their material benefit and be a means of doing good, that is also acceptable. But if the health and welfare of man be sent, spent in sensual desires, in a life on the animal plane, and in devilish pursuits, then disease is better than such health. Nay, death itself is preferable to such a life. If thou art desirous of health, which wish thou health for serving the kingdom? In a prayer, Baha'u'llah stated a specific purpose for good health. He said, heal thou the sicknesses that have assailed the souls on every side and have deterred them from directing their gaze towards the paradise that lieth in the shelter of thy shadowing name. Some people might ask why an aspirin seems to cure a headache faster than a prayer. There are many answers. One is that the aspirin works on a physical symptom. The prayer may be working on tribulations far beyond the physical. I may think I know my afflictions and difficulties, uh, but I may have a limited view and may not be thinking of the real problems interfering with my spiritual well being. Healing prayers deal with all ailments simultaneously physical, spiritual, emotional, psychological, and others, known and unknown, seen and unseen, all of which are complex and may take time and many prayers, not just for a temporary relief from symptoms, such as an aspirin, but for correcting underlying and often hidden maladies. The greatest value of good health is a means to serve Baha'u'llah. The world would have been better off if the terrorists had called in sick on 11 September 2001. But that is still only on the personal level. The prayer is well suited to address the global problems of the day. As mentioned earlier, Baha'u'llah said, soon will the present day order roll up and new one spread out in its stead. The sweeping changes mankind is going through are the result of his teachings and spirit, which affect the whole world. With change comes the distresses that are talked about in the prayer, tribulations, distresses, and loathsome afflictions and sorrows. It is the spirit that causes the wailing of the world. The affliction to the world is facing as a reaction to his new spirit of the age. Like the law of physics, for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. The positive spiritual teachings are being forcefully countered by material forces. And that's where tribulations come from. The names and attributes of this prayer are so expensive, expensive that they encompass all the ills of mankind. That may be why it is included with those tablets that have the words of the guardian, quote, been invested by Baha'u'llah with a special potency and significance, close quote. The prayer has power and is useful to heal the world's ills. The world is just beginning and go through its dramatic changes and brings forth a wide range of problems and calamities, man-made and natural, as the present day order is being rolled up and a new one spread out in its stead. It can't help but be prolonged, painful, and grueling process. This prayer can ease the unending pain of change. Netta. Guidance. This final request is unique in that the guidance is not for everybody. It is only for those who want it and desire to enter upon the paths of thy guidance and the ways of thy forgiveness and grace. This goes back to the idea of free will, prohibition of proselytizing and coercion. Ample guidance is available, but only for those who want and request entrance into both terrestrial and celestial Abha kingdoms in ultimate goal. Again, the guidance stated here seems to update rather than contradict 
the biblical statement that for many are called, but few are chosen. Anyone with the ardor of search and desire is invited to follow this guidance and can be included with the chosen. The tablet concludes with eight names and attributes of God. Powerful and all sufficing are mentioned first. Healing is the third one. The last five, protector, giving, compassionate, and not just generous and merciful, but all generous and all merciful. Part of the healing power invested in this special prayer may well be that it serves as a comfort and remedy for whatever bears obstacles and frustrations interfere with a person's attempt to tread the divine path and live in the spiritual world as we attempt to, quote, enter in much closer communion with God and identify more fully with his laws and precepts. These words remain the most important and fundamental challenge during the brief period of each one's spiritual apprenticeship on spaceship Earth. We are here during the time that the Guardian referred to as the age of frustration, destined to be, destined to precede the establishment of world order of Baha'u'llah. We need all the help or healing we can get, not only to survive the turbulence and frustration of this age, but to work collectively to heal its many problems. And this prayer is a powerful tool during the unique challenges of this age of frustration to help us bring the whole world, quote, into a closer communion with God and identify more fully with his laws and precepts. Now is a good time for comments and questions and hear about how, hear how people handled the homework. Yeah, please friends, um, unmute yourself. And, and a few people have uh, put some comments uh, with regards to the homework. I, I would like to ask Kathleen um, if she could maybe um, mention what she wrote, um, if she would like, and sorry if I put you on the spot, but others, please do the raise your hand because we all would love to hear from you. Well, I basically uh, felt the whole prayer, of course, is moving and, oh, I have to unmute. No, no you're okay. unmuted. You're fine. Okay. Um, but after, at the end, after reading it, you realize just the power of this prayer, as John expounded on when he was talking, how powerful this prayer is, that it encompasses the walls. It, it, for anybody who walks around the house, it, it, it's just to me the most powerful thing. And it's something that we should all realize in our lives that we could use this for so many purposes, uh, this prayer. Thank you. But, but I, I do have a question though for him, if, if it's appropriate right now to ask. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, when, when it says, ex entrance into both terrestrial and celestial Abha kingdoms, an ultimate goal for the guidance. What does that mean, actually? The, the well, terrestrial and the celestial? Yeah. Well, uh, you've heard of heaven on earth. Yes. There is a heaven on earth. In fact, I've heard uh, Rahia Kanum say that uh, uh, you don't go to heaven or hell when you die. You take it. You take it along with you. And, uh, <laughs> uh, however, that is limited. The celestial paradise is so much grander than that, but there's such an exaltation of being uh, part and parcel of the heaven on earth that that is really a, a, a wonderful thing in and of itself. And then there's then in the uh, when we graduate from this planet and get on to the next thing, then there's the celestial, which is beyond our imagination. Okay, thank you. Judy, please uh, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question or your comment. Uh, well, it's not a question. It's one of the phrases that I found that has been very uh, uh, great for me was, um, about the mid 80s, I was driving uh, in the winter 
on a road was uh, uh, around a corner and the person coming the other way was uh, driving too fast and ran into me. But at the time I had the whole long healing prayer memorized and I was chanting it as I was driving. And I was at the point of impact I was on, I call on the O unfolder, O ravager, O most clement one. And for the rest of the evening, I could not remember what was the next verse. So that's the only thing I had going through my mind that whole time. But to me, it was a great example that being ravaged, unfolded and ravaged is a clement thing. It's a good thing. Uh, it's a healing thing. And because uh, at that time, I was, it's been a problem mine all my life is I get interested in so many things. I get myself spread so thin, I can't find myself <laughs> And I was at that point. And after the accident, uh, I was, wasn't hurt. I just had a little cut on my head. The car was totaled. But um, I, I kept thinking, you know, if I'd been seriously injured or killed, the world would go on without all these pro projects that I think are so important. So I started uh, pulling myself in, <laughs> cutting off uh, unimportant, you know, prioritizing things. And it was... For, the, for about 10 years, it was a, a really good space in my life. And then I got back into the habit of spreading myself out too thin. But uh, it was a, a blessing that came out of what could on the surface look like something bad. <laughs> yes, uh, there's so many interesting things in the prayer that uh, talk about the fact that you have to be unfastened. You have to get let go of things of the past. and, and uh, uh, the up, upset is part of the thing. I heard one person just describe life is filled with urgent trifles. And I just love that idea. Who else has a comment or question? And I, I love uh, what was said about uh, uh, what Judy said about the, uh, uh, not that she had the accident, but the, just the, the special connection to a part of the prayer. And I'd like to hear of others. Yeah, yeah, please, Tina. So um, last week, well, actually, it's about a month now, I want to say, I think it's been a month or maybe a bit longer on Wednesdays. Uh, we've been meeting, I'm in Carlsbad, and we've been meeting in this area on Zoom and saying that prayer uh, on a weekly basis, uh, and also the Tablet of Ahmad right after that. So, you know, um, I don't know how many people would like to join us. I don't know if we're going to continue, but I'll let Neda know if anybody else would be interested. It's very potent, and the way it's being said is by two different people. A gentleman and a lady who say it, you know, with their own beautiful voices. So, anyway, I just thought I'll let you know. And we all feel so wonderful right after that Zoom. It only takes half an hour, but it's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. We need the information about your Zoom. Yeah, she'll, she'll, she said she'll send it to me and then um, I'll, I'll share it. Or you can put it in the chat, um, Tina. Uh, Kavita, please. Okay, thank you, John. Um, the verse that caught my attention was, I mean, all of them did, but this one, um, I call on thee, the Almighty, the succoring one, O concealing one, thou the sufficing, thou the healing, thou the abiding, O thou abiding one. I know there's a lot of reference about God being the concealer, but then reading the epistle to the son of the wolf, I came up across one of them that um, one of them that act, uh, is one type of concealer. He says, if ye become aware of a sin committed by another, conceal it that God may conceal your own sin. He verily is the concealer, the Lord of the grace abounding. So there's many references to concealing. And this one tells us that the, this, our fault, our sin is the domain of God. It's not anybody else's um, domain. God is the, all, and then on the same prayer, it's in the same verses, he's the almighty, the succoring one, which is 
he's the helper and he will be able to help us with our own fault. So we have to pray to Baha'u'llah. We have our weakness and our, our fall, but that's all for God to, to respond to that which in turn in the, in our, in the Baha'i face, it says we're not to confess with any, our sin to anybody else's except God. Then on the other hand, the, other, um, the hidden word says, breathe not the sin of man, sin of others, so as long as thyself art a sinner, should thou transgress this command, a curse would thou be. And to this I bear witness. Again, we have to, be detached and, and have trust in God that, yes, we do have fault. He is the Almighty and He will be the one who is help, who will help us. So by doing this, I think if we can find each one of these verses, that just started for me, one, but find the nuggets where all the answers are and, and, and probably that will help us understand it better. And that helped me a lot, reading that and finding the answer. Good thought. And it appears others, it's nobody's business if I do something wrong. That's between me and God. Yeah. Thank you for that. I'm sure a lot of people really did appreciate that, Kavita. Thank you. Um, and thank you for the research. Uh, Nancy, please. Regarding memorizing things. Um, I have a terrible time memorizing things, but when I put it to music, I can remember. And so I had some snippets of the long healing prayer in my mind, and maybe I was reading it on my phone while I was out walking one day, and the most beautiful melody came to me that I've used for a long time now and even recorded uh, part of it. I didn't record the whole long healing prayer, but some of the verses that I thought might be bright and appealing to the non-Baha'is who were in my sound circle, my chant circle. I so, would love to hear the long healing prayer put to music. Well, I could Give sing a couple snippet. verses. Yes, please, please do, please do, please do, please do. Yeah. Please so do. these, you know, these uh, melodies that co they come as a gift of the spirit, really. It mm -hmm. just came wholesale. So here's a little bit. I call on thee, O exalted one, O faithful one, O glorious one. I call on thee, O exalted one, O faithful one, O glorious one. Thou the sufficing, thou the healing, Thou the abiding, O oh, Thou abiding one. I call on Thee, O oh, peerless one, O oh, eternal one, O oh, single one. I call on Thee, O oh, peerless one, O oh, eternal one, O oh, single one. Thou the sufficing, Thou the healing, Thou the abiding, O oh, Thou abiding one. I call on Thee, O oh, most praised one, O oh, holy one, O oh, helping one. I call on Thee, O oh, most praised one, O oh, holy one, O oh, helping one. Thou the sufficing, Thou the healing, thou the abiding, O oh, thou abiding one. Thank you, that was lovely. Thank you for letting me. All right, drop it. Leave it. It's mine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But anybody else? Uh, let me just go to the page. We have like four pages. Hang on. Let me see if anybody. Okay, please, Cynthia. And I did catch you, David, but after I saw Cynthia, so I'll come to you. Cynthia, please unmute yourself. Yeah. The, the verse where it is, I call on thee, O all-compelling, O ever-abiding, 
O most knowing one, thou the sufficing, thou the healing, thou the abiding, O thou abiding one. It is um, so reassuring that it's also that it truly God knows me, my inner being, and it's unconditional. It's an unconditional, ever abiding. And to hear saying, oh, the abiding one, abiding one, each one, the mantra, and then to have one of the verses where it actually, where it says the ever abiding. And it, it just caught my heart to know that we are so loved. It's unconditional and it is so reassuring. Uh, David, please. Yeah, John, I, I loved your story about all things are of God. Um, the, young, the young boy that seemed to attract problems because I've, I've also struggled at times with seeing how all things are of God. And um, I suppose that verse, um, my calamity is, is my providence, is is also an illustration of that as well, do you, do you think? There was a wonderful Baha'i who had an interesting take on that particular hidden word. He interprets it this way. God put, gives us a jam in order to jar us so he can preserve, uh, preserve us. <laughs> can you say that again, John? God gives us a jam in order to jar us so he can preserve us. <laughs> yeah. I like that. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes we need we need a jolt, don't we? Yes. And right. uh, go ahead. Uh, I have Dan McFarland, please. Excuse me, we're doing the raise your hand, please. Just let me do it in order. Sorry. Dan McFarland, please unmute yourself. Thank you, Nada. First of all, I say thank you, John, for sharing your insights and your passion for the Word of God. It's a gift, and I appreciate it very much. And Nada, thank you for your patience and compassion as the moderator. Um, you're an exemplar of how to moderate a group with 100 people on it. Uh, thank you. You know, I wanted to share kind of my personal uh, experience with the long healing prayer. Uh, many of the attributes of God that I mentioned are moving. One line that moves me, and I'll explain why, is the line, the one that reads, I call on thee, O friend, O physician, O captivating one, thou the sufficing, thou the healing, thou the abiding, O thou abiding one. Earlier this year, I had what my doctor referred to as a health disaster. Um, and I had, uh, I won't go into details, but four months of a lot of um, suffering anxiety. And when I came out of the hospital, uh, for, I was in the hospital three times. And the third time I was in it after a major surgery and I came home and I was physically and emotionally um, exhausted and basically spent and I was um, really suffering from trying to recover on many levels. And I met with my local spiritual assembly and I consulted on this. I was a member of the assembly, but really consulting as an individual of, you know, really, it, it was an incredible trial and tribulation for myself and my wife, Marianne. And one of the members of the, this, of the assembly who happens to be a psychiatrist talked at length about the power of reciting the long healing prayer out loud. And his re recommendation to me as a member of the assembly and also as a psychiatrist, he said, that's the best medicine. Go home and recite it daily out loud. The powers and the healing that come from the, all the attributes of God. He says, I can't under explain it, but it's real. And so I took that to heart coming from my assembly. And um, Marianne can testify that I was so weak that I couldn't get through half the prayer saying it out loud. I, the, she would have to finish it for me because I didn't have the strength to finish it. But devoted to that for months and months, every night before I went to bed, 
I, you know, I'd sit at the side of the bed and that would be the prayer I'd read and the strength would come to me and the words would wash over me. And um, I always enjoyed when I got to that line because it spoke so much to me. Was, you know, I call on thee, O oh friend, O oh physician, O oh captivating one. And it really spelled to the prayer because it is, you know, we have a friend who's our healer and who is giving us this gift to, you know, reflect and let the words wash over us as, as a cleansing power. And the words also are captivating because as we go through each and every one of them, this is why I really, one of the reasons I signed up for this is that I wanted the better insights into each and every one of those attributes and why we're, you know, we kept repeating, thou the sufficing, thou the healing, thou the abiding, O thou abiding one. And, um, you know, that, that was captivating, you know, as we say it every time. So I can also say that it certainly has helped in terms of my healing, both physically and emotionally, and you know, certainly also spiritually. And so, you know, as we've talked about, I just wanted to share that I can testify that, you know, the power of the healing prayer, of the long healing prayer, saying it out loud. And John, I think as you said in the homework, you know, really think about the words, think about the patient, the pace and reflection. I even got down to the point where I knew that if I said it any faster than 11 minutes, saying it out loud, <laughs> I wasn't saying it right, you know? <laughs> and so it was also the point where, oh, I said in 10 minutes, no, that wasn't, you know, it was almost like a pace that it, where it worked. And uh, you try that for yourself at home, whether it be 11 or 12 minutes, but you'll find that, yeah, I said it too fast, you know, so, but anyways, but thank you. And thank you for everybody for being on this and thank you for letting me share. Thank you for sharing. You got to rename it the 11 minute prayer. Yeah, <laughs> for me, yes, it was the 11 minute prayer. It was like 11 minutes. <laughs> I do want to say a word about the, uh, uh, praying out loud, that's very hard for many Westerners uh, to, to, to do, particularly uh, you know, when not in a group when you're just alone to pray out loud. But uh, as Dan said, there's a power in that and there's more to it than that. Uh, uh, the, there's a statement, of course, that you're all familiar with about whoso recited in the privacy of his chamber. Um, when you pray out loud, you're enabling, uh, how shall I put it? Uh, well, the 100 martyrs in some of the tablet of uh, Ahmad uh, are waiting for someone to put them to work. And when you pray out loud, you're asking them to, to disseminate that fragrance. And so like two guitars in the same room, if you plug one string, the uh, tune string on the other guitar will start vibrating, even though they're not in the in, uh, next to it. Well, they may be some distance apart. The same thing happens when you pray out loud. You're setting a spiritual frequency that can vibrate and can be uh, uh, rewarding to other people, although they may not be aware of it. And it's up to the hundred martyrs that are service to disseminate that and find those responsive souls or strings that'll uh, vibrate to the tune of, of uh, the prayer. So praying out loud is more than just a, an individual benefit. It has, uh, it reaches out in other ways too. So us Westerners have to just get over the uh, hang up of, uh, of doing that. Okay, we also have Seema, please uh, Seema. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. I, before my question, I just wanted to add that I'm like Nancy, that if you put the prayer into music, I can, I can memorize it much better. In fact, uh, my dad used to wake us up in the morning by chanting a prayer. And um, my siblings and I have learned so many prayers through his chanting um, that we carried all our lives. Now my question, um, if we have so many special tablets that have got so potency on them, tablet of Ahmed, um, healing prayer, um, tablet, the fire tablet, all these tablets, is it 
that we to compare to religions in the past? Is it that we are more trouble that we needed these special tablets? Or are we the lucky ones who can, through these tablets, um, progress their soul? Um, which one is it? Well, I, I wouldn't choose one or the other. I think they're all appropriate. Uh, the manifestation comes when mankind is in two conditions. One, he's lost touch with the spirit of the previous religion. And secondly, uh, with the ever advancing civilization, he has uh, improved capacity to be able to absorb more. So he's ready for the next and the old has uh, the old fire has burned out, but your new timber is ready to uh, absorb the new. And so uh, I, I think you're you're right on in terms of uh, uh, how that works. And everything said to me, I think most people, most Baha'is, have no difficulty remembering one of the early songs they Baha'i songs they they learn. So, silly or whatever that they were but uh, it's memorizing without music is harder okay thank you uh stewart please yeah thank you john and it's good to see you in uh i, I assume that's your home instead of a hospital there you look a lot better <laughs> um, uh there are two two passages in here that that really kind of stuck stand out for me in 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 our our usage of the of the prayer uh, the first one says i call on thee o haven for all o shelter to all o all preserving one and it's really good to remember that, that no matter what the storm is god is there to protect us from the storm if we if we really remember to call upon him He's, he's there and he's going to shelter us and he's going to be that, that preservation for us. And the, the other phrase that I, that I really like is, I call on thee, O enkindler, O brightener, O bringer of delight. Just the, the, that light that comes into our souls and, and how God is bringing that and, and, and to, to lighten us and to delight to give us the light. That's, that's just truly amazing. I love it. Love it. Every time I read it. I think that's also telling us to, to be the bringers of delight for other people. Absolutely. Okay. We have Martha, please. Martha, please unmute yourself. Thank you, Neda. And experience the first words of Baha'u'llah that I read were the long healing prayer. And um, yeah, there was no going back. And it was associated with the birth of my friend's child, who I'd been helping her in a difficult birth. And, and then the uh, first time I chanted it, Lorith, Lorintha Umtuch, who is a Yakima in the state of Washington, has uh, recorded the long healing prayer chanted with a medicine rattle. And I would put that uh, CD in my car and, and just chant. I didn't have a CD player at home. That's why I was praying in the car, by the way. And, and so when my husband was dying, I left his daughter with him and I just wanted to be away so I could pray. And plus I had to pick up people from the ferry. And it was just so powerful. The prayer is very much associated with transition and birth and death for me. And it's, it's just a spiritual state of being. There's no way to, there's no way to recite this prayer without going to a different place. Judy gave me courage to share. Thanks, Judy Selmer. Thank you, Nida. Thank you, Thank you. John. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're sending you love. I, I just want you to know there's something in your voice. So I just want, um, we're all going to keep you in our prayers, Martha. I, I feel you need that right now. You got it. Thank you. He's been in the next world a long time, but sometimes, you know, we've got a pandemic. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Betsy, please unmute yourself. Hi. Um, so uh, 
I lived in a small town in Vermont. I remember Martha from Vermont as well. Um, and a um, different area of the state. And we were uh, a small group in Hoosick Falls, New York, 10 minutes west, a small group. Some in uh, Williamstown, Mass, a small group. And we got together. We couldn't figure out what to do, what to do. This is like, this is probably 30 years ago. What to do, what to do. And we said, let's just get together and pray. So every Monday night, we got together and we prayed because we just liked praying together. It was very simple. And we committed to doing the long healing prayer each time. And uh, it was an opportunity to invite uh, invite friends to come and join us uh, who, anyway. Anyway, uh, after, you know, doing this over and over for, you know, just one, you know, the wonder, the rhythm of repetition and all that and hearing all the voices, I realized that there's one verse that even to this day, if I'm going around sharing, going around sharing the reading, I get really upset if somebody else gets this verse and I don't. And that is, I call on the, oh, the most trusted Oh, the best lover, O oh, Lord of the dawn, thou the sufficing, thou the healing, thou the abiding, O oh, thou abiding one. It just picks me up and sails me away, and I couldn't even, <laughs> it, I couldn't even begin to explain why, it, but I go to another place when that, when that is my turn to read. Thanks for sharing that. It's uh, easy to imagine how that can be a source of ecstasy. We have Donna, please. Donna, please um, unmute yourself. Okay. Um, I, I, I just wanted to say that I have certain lines underlined from when I read it before, and I'll read them, and then I'm going to read what I wrote after I read. Well, you'll hear it. Um, the one that really moves me is, I call in thee, O perfecting one, O unfettered one, O bountiful one, thou the he sufficing, thou the healing, Thou the abiding of the abiding one. And I think as an African American, for me, unfettered took on such a great um, meaning when I first read it because I, I felt like I needed to be freed from all of the things that I thought were binding me to one identity or one, you know, I grew up pretty much in a predominantly white environment and I was always being told like, you know, what I was and people would mispronounce my name and they would say, Denise, and I would say, no, it's Denise. And they said, well, black people aren't French, so it must be Denise, she must be Portuguese. And I was like in third grade, you know, so, so I was, I love the unfettered one because it really made me feel like I was being free, you know? Um, so this is what I wrote because I was trying to do the homework that John gave us. So I teach, right? And here it is. This morning, when I began the long healing prayer, I began quickly trying to get it in before my students showed up on Zoom. Then something reminded me that the homework was to say it slowly, thoughtfully, and find a line that meant something special to me. And suddenly I felt sad, like crying. I knew that I had approached the divine spirit in a way that was unworthy. It was like I realized if I was in love, I would never approach my beloved with such a careless attitude. And I was sorry that I had no understanding of what I had just begun. I stopped and I will say it when I really can say it properly with deep reverence and deep joy. And suddenly the feeling that I had when I began came back. And it really did feel like, the, like it was a conversation as crazy as that sounds. Like when I was starting to say it really fast, I didn't feel it, it was just words. And when I went slowly, I felt like, you know, a door opened. So that's my story. And I just want to say thank you to um, all of you for listening. And thank you to John for all the wisdom you bring us. I uh, note in the, the chat box here that uh, oh, it's, it's gone now, but uh, someone was talking about the prayers that you make up yourself. Um, all sincere prayers are heard and Abdul Baha gives us that promise. Uh, the only difference is the, the manifestation of God knows me better than I do. And so his prayers can hit my soul uh, even more directly than what I make up myself. 
but there's nothing wrong with making up your own. But it, it, it's just, I think, uh, a step higher for the revealed prayer. Rebecca, please. Although the, uh, the shortest prayer, there was a friend of mine who was driving on a very icy road in Alaska and lost control of his car going down a hill. It was going side, sideways and he yelled out, allow help. <laughs> <laughs> and he was helped enough so he didn't crash. He ended up uh, safely a, in a snowbank and was able to get out easily. But I thought that the brevity of that prayer was was eloquent. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go to Rebecca and then to Kavita. Okay, thank you. Um, I wanted to um, comment on verse number 26. I was so surprised when Judy first mentioned it because out of 40 verses to hear someone commenting as well was intriguing. But the comment that always comes to me when I'm trying to understand something is what does this look like? And I am glad that Judy gave one image of what it looked like, that it um, helped to wake up some images in myself. And so um, um, also as each person has shared, it's brought the prayer to life in different ways. And so um, I just want to say thank you to that, but also to thank you, John, for um, uh, all that you have shared with us on this, that it's really brought a fuller understanding and feeling to any prayer that we're saying. And I find that oftentimes when I'm looking at other writings now and other prayers, that there are certain words that jump out to me because of the understanding out of this study that we've done. Um, but also too, to people who've shared each time, I think that as we use these prayers, that I know I will remember you in my prayers. And so it will give a long life to this course in so many ways. So again, thank you to John and thank you, Netta, for your um, facilitation of this course as well. Kavita, please, and then Kandan. And then, and then we have a message in the chat that um, I'll read that to John. It's from Penny. I have a question, but before that, um, last week we talked about the slayer, slay us the lover in one of the verses, and oh God of grace to the wicked. And I, I thought about it. The, the word that intrigued me was the lover, which was in the capital, on cap, in capital. So to me, it's talking about the manifestation of God, who mainly about the Bob who was martyred, and we know Christ was martyred too. So, and then it's talking about uh, God will, and, and the Bob knew his destination. When he talked to Kudus, he said, well, this is the last time we're, we're gonna be meeting. and." will be meeting again in the next world i'm paraphrasing but so he knew what it is. so god does has destined for them what it is so to me and then says oh god um the god of grace to the wicked and we know that he was the the, the environment was filled of, of tyranny so to me it's that god would knew the martyrdom of the bob and he took away the Bob, and that was a sacrifice that he did, but he was graceful to the wicked so that they would do, do no longer harm to the environment. And in a way it's saying that God will do whatever to preserve the, the, um, the, the environment and to, for his teaching. And the slayers, the lovers is more of the sacrifice of the manifestation. And we know in sacrifice of their life, there's more potency and power. My question, okay, so that was it. My question is that it's about the tablet of Ahmad. When Ahmad took the tablet back to Iran, do we know what the condition of the of, of the place was? Were there any Baha'is there or was he the first one to take the tablet and introduce the faith? Because I, from, from the story I hear is that 
when he took, he had lots of difficulties, even with the Barbies, and 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 he was um, he was not welcome with, of, of of teaching the the faith. So I was just wondering, what was the condition of the of the of Iran at that time? Uh, John, do you want to answer um, uh, a question towards the Tablet of Ahmad, or should we just leave that for the next session? And this, oh, okay. uh, this one on the long healing prayer. I think that's best. Okay, please. Sorry. Okay. But thank you. We love the question. Just remind us of it. Email it to me. Uh, Khandan, please. Sure. Thank you. Um, I apologize. I came in late um, to, the uh, to the session today, but I, I don't know if this was discussed or not, but I would like to hear from John and Annetta, this is probably a repeat question from your other classes. Uh, John, you know, a lot of times when I'm tired at night, I rather listen to the long healing prayer on YouTube and just, you know, uh, observe it that way. Would that, re would that be the same as, re obviously it's not the same as reciting, but to me it has the same effect. Um, what are your thoughts or should I just stop that and start reciting it myself? Well, my thought is that uh, whatever that you do with uh, the sincerity and devotion is acceptable and that uh, uh, no two people are going to have the same approach or do things the same way. For instance, uh, I may not particularly um, be interested in the way you do it, but that's fine because I do it my way and it may not appeal to you. And so I, I think that's a very individual thing. And uh, also uh, a matter of growth. In other words, we might do something for a while and decide that we want to change a little bit or do things a little bit differently, which is just a uh, natural uh, progression of things. Thank you. Uh, however you're doing it is great. Just keep doing it. I will. Thank you, John. You look great. She said you look great, John. <laughs> uh, we have a question from Penny Hubert, which is in the chat. Um, she would like to know your thoughts, John, on the line, O oh, thou my soul, O oh, thou my beloved, O oh, thou my faith. Well, my thoughts on that, uh, oh, shall I say they're a work in progress. Uh, I commented on them a little bit uh, last time. Uh, I've always had the feeling that the soul was mine, but here it says, oh thou my soul, as if it's God's. Well, as a matter of fact, uh, as I understand uh, uh, the, uh, the process, at the moment of creation, you have a soul assigned to you and that's the recorder of your life, but uh, it really belongs to God because uh, uh, as the uh, uh, phrase goes, which is oftentimes uh, put on uh, people's uh, tombstones, uh, come from God and return to God, unto him shall I return. Well, that's the soul that comes from God and unto God it shall return. In the meantime, we have custody of it and uh, we are the, uh, uh, the ones who, uh, uh, how shall I say, uh, shape the soul according to our own spiritual growth and development. And oh, thou my faith, that's not difficult for me to understand. And oh, thou my beloved, uh, where God is the object of, of, of that. Uh, oh, thou my faith, everything as, as i learn new things i try to adopt them because i must i might not know much about god but i know that, that what he says is right and what and uh, whether or not it's difficult for me is beside the point it's the best for me and so that is part of my faith is the fact that no matter what happens there's a, uh, a divine purpose can be found on it. Not necessarily. Uh, God doesn't put us in trouble in order to educate us, but he's so clever that he can make the best out of any lousy situation we get ourselves into if we let him. And so this is part of uh, 
uh, the faith in God is the fact that no matter how much I mess up and cause myself troubles, God can find a suitable way out of it if I let him. Thank you so much, John. I really appreciate the, all of the things that you've been, you know, I, I just appreciate so much all of the insights that you've had with these le three tablets. I, I say the, Healy, the, the fire tablet every morning and I'm really researching uh, all of the different parts of it. And I say the, he the long healing prayer. And I can't get through them without crying. I just can't. But uh, because they, <clears throat> I'm sorry, they touch my heart. They, they just touch my heart uh, so much. So really, thank you very much. I remember a uh, conference that after the passing the Guardian, when he called uh, First Continental Conferences in the middle of the 10-year crusade. I was a relatively new Baha'i then, but uh, Dr. Jew Carey was uh, uh, chairing it. And uh, those of you who knew Dr. Jew Carey, he's a very strong individual. And in the middle of something, uh, he started to shed some tears and he pulled out this big red bandana to wipe them away. And he said, that's all right. The Guardian said, tears are a bomb for the soul. <laughs> okay, John, I think, um, I think that wraps this up for our first round of these six-week courses. So thank you, everybody. John, anything you want to add before we remind them to look out for the February sessions? No, just that it's been a joy to be involved with this uh, because uh, uh, having to put on a program like this forces you to dig deeper into uh, other things that you might just uh, not bother with so much. And so thank you for, uh, uh, for that opportunity. And Netta, thank you so much for putting this together and for your patience throughout the whole thing. And you've been so helpful. But then we'll see, we'll have another round in February. We'll see how that goes. Yeah. It'll be awesome. It'll be awesome. I love you and thank you everyone. Good night. Thank you, thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you, John. Good night. 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 Thank you. Thank you much. It's been great. All right. Thank you.